Hello, welcome back to Quarterline. Today, as we've recently looked at the Renault 30, I thought we'd look at another uh, equally impressive big French executive car, the Peugeot 604. The 604 was first seen uh, at the Geneva Motor Show in March 1975 and had a 10-year uh, production run uh, finishing in 1985. Now this big Pinning Farina designed car shared that same 2.7 V6 engine that was jointly developed between Renault, Peugeot and Volvo. At this time in 1975, why were all these big executive cars coming out? Yeah, probably 40 years since the last big Peugeot executive car was around. Well, in the French market, it was kind of like seen as being uh, the affluence of the market was increasing. Therefore, they thought there was more opportunity for these big executive cars. And now they've got a V6 engine to help with costs. Although this was certainly an expensive car at the time. The brochure we're going to look at is from 1980, so right in the middle of the production run. And we'll look at this brochure and we can see that it's a very elegant designed car. So how well did it do? Well, we'll look at that later on in the video, but first of all, let's open this brochure up. Okay, and we're looking inside the first page of that brochure now. Initially, it talks about it being a grand touring car and a luxury car, etc, etc. And then it goes on to show the three different versions, including in this book. The SL and the TI are both using that 2.7, uh, exactly a 2664cc V6 engine. The one, like we've talked about, has been jointly developed between Renault, Volvo and Peugeot. One of the interesting things on here, it's actually showing um, the turbo diesel version as well. The turbo diesel came out in 1979 and it was actually the first production turbo diesel sold in Europe. Yes, Mercedes had turbo diesels in America, but this was the first one in Europe. Like I say, launched in 79, and this was really the early days of turbo diesels. So one of the big problems with these were it was an extremely hard car to start in cold weather. They developed this um, and it got better, but these early ones certainly had problems with cold starting. Uh, one of the main differences between the SL and the TI, the TI's got this uh, fuel injection system. And a few little extras on top of the SL, but that's that's the main. The SL's really got them twin carburetors. But anyway, let's open this brochure up further and see what we can see. And here we have on the next page a really nice image of this 604. I think really an elegant design. I think one magazine referred to it as being quietly elegant. It wasn't in your face. It was a really nice sort of elegant design Peugeot and you know later Peugeots um, had these qualities on the larger Peugeots as well. It's certainly a lovely styled timeless classic looking vehicle. I really like this. I don't always like Pininfarina design cars amazingly enough um, but I think this is certainly one of the uh, better ones for sure. It's talking on about this uh, 2664cc uh, v6 engine uh, doing 116 miles per hour in the ti version and a 0 to 62 of 10 seconds for you know the early 80s late 70s that wasn't bad figures for a large car and it's also showing about this diesel having a top speed of 98 the diesel of course was really 
the sensible option for those doing a lot of miles and it certainly would do a lot of miles these early Peugeots were very well built strong cars there's no doubt about that and I guess that really leads up to one of the problems really with this car uh, launched in 75 these big French cars yes it was a more affluent time in France but it was also uh, shortly after a, a, an oil crisis so people were really thinking about you know fuel economy uh, in a big way and I guess this is why it's led to uh, turbo diesels uh, this is kind of the beginning of the era of turbo diesels they became more and pop more popular in the sort of late 80s um, but this time it was kind of like new technology in a way I don't think the, the having a turbo diesel saved the 604 from being a, a good selling car but nevertheless it's nice to see it here This page is having a look at those very nice seats, sort of like the French uh, response uh, or idea of a executive car and an extremely comfortable car it looks indeed. Lots of equipment on there of course, you know, electrically operated sunroof, electric windows, electric rear windows, so all the goodies. Um, in the early 80s so you know if you jumped in this car from uh, a lesser spec lower version or average car it must have been it must have made you feel really special and even the back seats look extremely well padded one of the good things about these cars is the doors did open really wide so they made for a nice executive car for sure Here we look at a closer look at that Peugeot dashboard. Very well equipped, everything you would expect to see on an executive car in the 80s. Yes, it does look quite plasticky by today's standards. But nevertheless, very well equipped, very comfortable, perfectly suitable for motorway cruising. And here we have your typical 80s executive car scene next to the mansion after some kind of party in these very sort of late 70s, early 80s outfits. But kind of like the standard image you saw so many times on these uh, more upmarket vehicles. This page is just showing the different engines. They were very proud of this V6 jointly developed engine. So it's showing a great picture of it and alongside that new diesel as well. This now is really one of my favorite pages of this particular brochure, showing these optional equipment you could get. Uh, so you could have this lovely sort of like leather interior that armrest looks fantastic on that. It really suits the car well. You could have the automatic transmission again, which really should be, it feels more right in this sort of class of car to have that automatic transmission. And these fantastic rare uh, quad wipers on the lights, which uh, are amazing. I really like them. Yes, they became more popular in the 80s, <clears throat> but quite the amazing feature. I don't really know why it became so popular in the 80s to have wipers on the headlamps and we don't ever see them now but nevertheless what a great feature uh, and we've also got things like air conditioning uh, which is only available on that TI um, and it's talking about this deep luster metallic paint with a lacquer finish standard on the TI optional on the other two but overall you could really spec this car up really well but of course, it was already a very expensive car. Some may say some of these features should have already been standard, but you know, it is what it is. Then we have a little bit on the safety, the safety features, crash testing, etc. And then finally, the specification and equipment levels, as they so often are on this brochure. 
and yeah it is well equipped as standard you know i can see central locking power assisted steering laminated glass tinted glass electric operated sunroof electric operated windows etc 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 so yeah he was well equipped as standard uh, fuel economy as you can see on the bottom right hand corner at the constant 56 it's kind of like looking at the high 20s uh, low 30s unless you got that diesel which was 46.3 um, at a constant 56 so you can imagine why some more more sort of long distance travelers would opt for that turbo diesel but like i say it did have a problem with cold starting when it came out and that's kind of like the fact the end of the this particular brochure i had to also include this back page as it shows sort of that elegant back end and those huge headrests um, as well dated 1980 as i can say and a uk brochure so how well did the peugeot 604 do well not as well as what peugeot had hoped sold around about 153,252 cars sold in that 10 year life span it wasn't great when you consider a Citroen CX this Peugeot sold about one eighth as what a Citroen CX sold so it really was a failure they did make money at it so it wasn't a failure in that way but a failure in the number of cars that were sold and what was the issue well like I say it was a fuel crisis uh, Peugeot had hoped this affluent French market would buy these cars but they still tended to buy the lower spec, uh, more e economical versions of French cars. And that kind of like found that cars like Mercedes and BMW really took advantage of this and became the market leaders in Europe. So why did the Peugeot, which is after all an extremely good car in many ways do so bad? Well, a lot came down to the price when it was launched in 1975 it was 4785 pounds just to put that in context a citroen cx palace was 4361 pounds a 5 series bmw was around about 4361 pounds too and if you looked in the UK at something like a three litre Granada, it was only around about £3,400. So most people obviously went for a Granada. It was way cheaper and still a nice car. So today, an extremely rare car if you ever see one in the UK. I'd be surprised if there's more than 10 still running around on the roads there. Uh, but like I say, I do like this car and it's a shame that it didn't do better. So it's another of these French cars that really are my favourite. Renault was doing its hatchbacks, it liked doing these big hatchbacks, very practical. Peugeot was sticking with this more traditional saloon uh, but a very stylish and beautiful design citroen was doing its unique wackiness with the floaty floaty suspension and everything a little bit different but i liked each three manufacturers take on more upmarket cars looking at it in different ways i would happily have any of them thank you once again for watching quarterlight today Please do like and subscribe and comment. It's always interesting to see your comments and your experience with any of these cars. And we'll see you very soon. So for now, take care and goodbye.